You are looking at five colossal lakes that together hold one-fifth of all the surface fresh water on Earth. Scientists say the American Great Lakes were carved by ancient glaciers, but that is not the whole story. Beneath them lie billion-year-old fractures set long before the ice. If these inland seas are just geological accidents, why did the planet's largest freshwater system form right here and not anywhere else? Unraveling that puzzle means going back to the very stone, to the time just before the ice began to carve, long before the first drop of glacial meltwater touched this land, the continent's interior was already marked by deep wounds. A billion years ago, tectonic forces began to tear North America apart, ripping open the mid-continent rift. Molten rock surged upward, cooling into a hard, dark lining of basalt that now lies beneath Lake Superior. This immense fracture stretches more than 1,000 miles, a scar still buried beneath the lake's floor and the forests of Minnesota and Michigan. Over millions of years, ancient seas returned again and again, blanketing the rift with layers of softer sandstone, shale, and limestone. Each new deposit settled over the volcanic foundation creating a complex stack of brittle and resilient layers. Farther east, another rupture opened in the crust 570 million years ago, the St. Lawrence Rift. This fault would later guide the shape of Lakes Ontario and Erie, as well as the route of the St. Lawrence River. In the north, the oldest rocks, hard, crystalline remnants of Earth's deep past formed the Canadian Shield, while younger sedimentary rocks filled low-lying basins to the south. The Michigan Basin, now hidden beneath the Lower Peninsula, became a vast bowl of ancient sediments, some more than one mile thick. This web of faults, rifts, and contrasting rock types set the blueprint for what followed. Where the stone was fractured, soft or loosely bound, it would yield more easily to the relentless forces yet to come. The memory of these ancient ruptures and buried valleys remains etched into the bedrock, waiting for the next chapter of erosion to reveal their hidden paths. At the height of the last ice age, a sheet of ice thicker than most skyscrapers pressed down on the heart of North America. This was the Laurentide Ice Sheet, stretching more than a mile above the ground and weighing down the crust with a force almost beyond imagination. Under its immense weight, the ice moved slowly but relentlessly, grinding across the land like a colossal belt sander. Bedrock shattered and crumbled as the glacier advanced, its frozen base packed with sand, gravel, and rock, nature's own abrasive. Every inch forward meant scraping, polishing, and scoring the ancient layers beneath. Where the rock was fractured or soft, the ice gouged even deeper, sometimes more than 400 meters below today's lake surface. Glacial geomorphologists point to the drumlins, thousands of streamlined hills, each shaped by the glacier's passage. These ridges, aligned with the direction of ice flow, act as silent witnesses to the power of moving ice. In places, the glacier plucked entire slabs of rock from the ground, leaving behind steep-sided basins with over-deepened troughs. The largest of these, now hidden beneath Lake Superior, records the deepest scars, evidence of both relentless abrasion and sudden violent plucking. This was not a gentle process. The ice carved, fractured, and excavated, 
following the path of least resistance set by ancient rifts and valleys. What remained was a chain of immense depressions, each one a testament to the raw mechanical force of ice. These basins would become the blueprint for the Great Lakes, ready to be filled by the meltwater that followed. As the ice sheet began to retreat, the empty basins left behind did not immediately become the Great Lakes as we know them. Instead, meltwater surged into these depressions, creating a series of temporary lakes, each stage shaped by the position of the ice and the land's subtle tilt. Lake Maumee formed first. Its surface stood more than 230 feet above modern Lake Erie, hemmed in by ice to the north and ancient ridges to the south. As the glacier inched back, new outlets opened and old ones closed, and the water sought every possible escape. Lake Chicago filled the southern basin of present-day Lake Michigan, draining southwest through the Des Plaines Valley. Then came a moment of chaos. The Chicago outlet failed, and this failure unleashed a mega flood that carved the modern Illinois River Valley in a matter of days. Downstream, the land bears scars of this deluge, broad floodplains and gravel bars left by torrents of water moving faster than any river today. To the east, Lake Algonquin and Lake Iroquois rose and fell, each leaving behind strand lines and beach ridges high above the current lakes. Their shapes and elevations record the restless dance between water, ice, and land. Each new lake phase redrew the shoreline, sometimes flooding forests and valleys, sometimes draining away in a rush that left entire landscapes exposed. Water levels could swing by dozens of feet within a single generation. The map of the Great Lakes was never stable, always shifting, each pulse of meltwater, each collapse of an ice dam, a reminder that these inland seas were born in a world of constant change. The ground beneath the Great Lakes has never truly settled. When the last ice melted away, the crust, once pressed down by a mile of ice, began to rise. A slow, steady rebound that continues even now. In the north, GPS stations and NASA's ICE Sat-2 satellite reveal the land lifting by one to three millimeters each year. This invisible motion has been quietly tilting the entire basin for thousands of years, redrawing the paths that water takes across the continent. As the land heaved upward, the ancient outlets, once draining southwest toward the Mississippi, gradually closed. The lakes searched for new escape routes, and the outlets shifted again and again. About 7,000 years ago, the uplift in the southwest forced the waters east, carving a new chain of connections. Lake Ontario took shape, and the Niagara River became the main outflow for Lake Erie. Where meltwater once trickled over low divides, it now plunged over the Niagara Escarpment, a hard limestone ledge formed hundreds of millions of years earlier. This was the birth of Niagara Falls, a waterfall so young in geologic time that its gorge is still raw and unfinished, cutting upstream year by year. Even now, the story isn't over. The northern shores continue to rise, the southern edges settle, and the tilt of the land shifts by imperceptible degrees. The lake's outlets, once scattered and uncertain, have stabilized into the pattern we recognize today, and the crust's slow rebound carries on, quietly reshaping the future of these inland seas. The first people to reach the shores of these new lakes arrived as the world was still settling from the last great thaw. 
Archaeological evidence places human presence in the Great Lakes region between 10 and 11,000 years ago, a time when shorelines shifted from season to season and islands appeared or vanished with the rise and fall of water. For these early communities, the lakes were not fixed landmarks, but living boundaries, sometimes a route, sometimes a barrier. Knowledge keepers among the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee passed down stories that mapped these changes, describing places where land once connected distant peninsulas or where a river became a bay. These oral maps, handed down for generations, preserved memories of a landscape in motion long before lines were drawn on paper. Today, those narratives echo the scientific record, offering a human memory of a world still taking shape. In 2007, researchers mapping the floor of Lake Huron stumbled onto something extraordinary. A submerged forest nearly 9,000 years old lay preserved in silence beneath the waves. Tree stumps still anchored in ancient peat revealed a time when water levels were far lower and dry land stretched where today only fish swim. Scientists from NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory used multi-beam sonar and seismic profiling to trace the outlines of lost rivers and valleys buried under modern sediment. These hidden channels, once carved by meltwater or flowing streams, now lie sealed beneath silt. Their paths echo the restless shifts of shoreline and water. Every new survey uncovers evidence that the lakes are still in motion. Water levels rise and fall in cycles, sandbars appear and vanish, and the land itself continues to tilt. Even now, the Great Lakes are not fixed in place, but remain alive, shaped and reshaped by forces both ancient and ongoing. Every drop in these lakes still traces ancient movements beneath our feet. As the land rises and water shifts, our future here will be shaped by forces millions of years in the making. The Great Lakes are still unfinished, reminding us that nature's masterpiece is never truly complete. What do you see in their changing shores?